my family and I lived at a large property called Gladstone Villa in the former mining town of Bargoed in the Carfilly County borough of South Wales in the valleys from 1969 to 1978 we experienced activity that simply defied rational explanation such as lights going on and off we witnessed electrical cables being pulled and my grandfather bill claimed to have a glass bottle thrown at his head as he entered the main bedroom missing him by inches i didn't personally see this myself but i can still recall the time he came from there with the broken bottles in his hand and told us what happened there was the occasional sighting but this was very rare indeed so rare that in all the 9 years i was there i never once saw it but i did hear it many times in the bedroom it's still worth mentioning that my mother caroline saw it on at least two occasions there were also regular footsteps heard in the main bedroom every evening sometimes during the day when we'd all be downstairs watching tv one of us would turn the volume down and hear it more clearly and my grandfather bill would point to the ceiling and say he's by here he's by there now trying to make out where the footsteps were coming from exactly there were five members of the family that were living at gladstone villa my maternal grandfather william higgs known as bill to family and friends a retired miner who worked at the local colliery he was a short bald man who liked nothing more than to listen to his country and western lps johnny cash glen campbell and so on he also liked westerns on the tv that starred john wayne or clint eastwood my maternal grandmother was rita hicks she was a short woman who was a housewife she was completely teetotal but liked a smoke she also liked collecting garden gnomes and watched soap operas on tv my mother caroline dexter met my father at the local bakehouse in baldwin street she was day shift regularly and my father worked the night shift he would stay behind to make her a cup of tea and chat they dated for 3 years before they got married on monday the 1st of april 1968 the beatles were number 1 with lady madonna very apt they did not get a place of their own but decided to live with my grandparents at gladstone villa which was in cardiff road i was born august 24th 1969 when everyone was listening to the latest number 1 of the charts honky tronk woman by the rolling stones it was soon after that that my mother said that strange things started to happen i was just a baby when she said it all started off rather quietly like small tappings here and there but nothing too noticeable but in time the activity gradually increased one time my mother said the family heard a noise like someone jumping down from the attic and onto the landing naturally thinking that someone was trying to break in they went to see what was going on when they got there they found no one but the hatch to the attic was open whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the main bedroom which incidentally was my grandparents bedroom it soon made its presence known by walking around the bedroom and the sound of dragging could be heard one day my mother went upstairs to that bedroom to get my father up for work so he could get ready for his night shift when she got to there she was confronted by the sight of the ironing board placed on my father's torso as he slept when he awoke he was astonished to find the situation he was in he suspected my grandfather bill was playing pranks but in time he knew my grandfather was not responsible for it and he told his work friends what was going on there and it got around that gladstone villa was haunted my parents separated in 1972 and my father left gladstone villa but it wasn't because of what was going on at gladstone villa it was just a breakdown of a marriage they finally divorced on april 25th 1975 the british band 
the Bay City Rollers were number one in the charts with Bye Bye Baby. Again, very apt. It would have been amusing, but for the fact of what was going on there. I was barely two years old, so I have no memory of my father living there. But he would come to see me every Saturday, take me to see my paternal grandparents and to the local cinema. Great times, even though the paranormal activity persisted. As I got older, I witnessed the activity for myself. I actually saw the poltergeist activity for myself. I saw the electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces. I saw the lights going on and off. And when my grandfather Bill would play records on Sunday, as the family did at dinner, the music would turn off on its own. It took exception to the British band Slade and any religious TV shows my grandmother Rita would watch. The local police were also involved. I remember them popping their heads into the attic, hesitating and not going in, but they suggested it was my father playing a prank on the family. A family friend, Miss Ivy France, she was more of a friend of my grandma Rita. She was very skeptical when my grandmother told her that Gladstone Villa was haunted. I can still remember Ivy going into the main bedroom, looking around and saying it was a vibration from the traffic. But she was soon to change her mind when she experienced it for herself. It was then she suggested the local press and a medium. The medium was John Matthews. And when he came to Gladstone Villa, he started by asking the family questions. He then began by challenging the spirit to perform knocking on the ceiling. And sure enough, it responded by knocking back at him. At some point, John went into a trance to try and make contact, but he failed to get a name. He later confirmed the obvious that there was indeed a presence there. And it was an earthbound spirit that had unfinished business. A priest by the name of Graham Jones was called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property. And after a few prayers, he duly left. It was quiet for a few short months after that. No incidents, but it did return and with a vengeance. This time it decided to show itself. One evening, my grandfather Bill, my mother Caroline and I were watching television. My grandmother Rita was reading a book when all of a sudden my mother just so happened to look to her left and she saw the full solid figure of a monk standing by the doorway. We did not see this as we were otherwise occupied. But she later described the monk in detail, typical brown habit complete with hood over the head. So she couldn't see the face. It sounded very much like a 16th century Benedictine monk. Fred Davies was also a friend of my grandfather Bill. They worked together at the local colliery and he would visit most evenings. Fred was a slim man who would wear a flat cap and glasses and smoked some homemade cigarettes that hung from his lips when he spoke. He would sit in his favorite chair by the open fire and talk to the family and watch TV with us. One day, Fred was with us in his usual place by the open fire. I was quietly playing with my toys by the sideboard. It was quiet when all of a sudden, there was one very loud bang. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head and I ran to my mother for comfort. When it was quiet, we went upstairs. My grandfather Bill would always be first and I would be last. When we go to that bedroom, we found nothing that could account for the noise. Fred later told us that he ducked his head as he thought it was going to come through the ceiling. Fred told us of another experience he had at Gladstone Villa. My grandfather Bill liked to look out the landing window that overlooked Cardiff Road into Bargoed Town Centre. This time Fred joined him and he said he felt something brush past him. When he looked, there was nothing there. The most frightening experience I had was when I was alone in that particular bedroom. I made sure the light was on, it was very quiet. And I was laying on the bed facing the window that overlooked Cardiff Road. When I suddenly felt something heavy pounce on the bottom of the bed. I heard the bed springs go just once. And I felt the bed bounce. 
I didn't look straight away. But when I did, there was nothing there. I went downstairs to tell my family. And we all went back up. We saw distinctive paw marks on the bed like that of an animal. I later found out that my grandfather Bill had a black Labrador called Tovey, who died before I was born. My grandfather Bill and my mother Caroline claimed to have heard a baby crying there. But as I didn't hear it at the time, I took very little notice of what they said. The activity got so bad that my mother, grandmother and I slept downstairs with the lights on. It was only my grandfather Bill who was supposedly brave enough to sleep up there. It was then that he himself had yet another experience in there. He told us he was lying on the bed when all of a sudden he couldn't move. He couldn't even shout for us for help. This could have well have been sleep paralysis, but he said he heard something in the room with him. My grandmother Rita had her own experiences. One day she went upstairs into the room to get my grandfather up. When she saw the boiler door room open all by itself. She didn't stay there to see what it was. But she rushed out the room. On another occasion, she said she had the sensation of something pulling her under her foot. Like she had stepped on this gown. We had the ghost for so long that my grandmother Rita gave her a pet name. She called him Johnny, and my grandfather Bill would shout out the name to provoke a reaction, but nothing happened. Ivy Francis's son Charles got to hear about what was going on at Gladstone Villa, and he came along with some friends, and with my family's permission, they went into a bedroom. It frightened one of his friends, and to this day, he still says it was a spooky place. My mother Caroline had an operation on her toe and ended up on crutches to support her. The local nurse would tend to her foot, and my mother sat in the chair when the nurse came that day. The nurse knelt down to tend her, and she told my mother not to hold her. My mother looked at my grandmother Rita in amazement, as she wasn't holding the nurse at all. My mother made her own conclusions that it was Johnny the ghost that was holding her, so as not for the nurse to hurt her. The only time I heard the ghost being vocal was the time we were all in the room. One of us wanted to use the bathroom and we couldn't get in there. My grandfather Bill said, he's behind there. I heard quite distinctively the sound of Gregorian chant. And that was it. Nothing more. We left in the summer of 1978 when two local businessmen bought the property and Gladstone Villa was eventually converted into a small hotel, and its name changed to Reds Park Hotel. On the night before we moved, there was one final incident we experienced, as if it knew that we were going, and that it was its way of saying goodbye. My mother, grandmother and I got ready to go to sleep. The light was still on, and then we heard the doorknob turning, as if someone was trying to get in. At first, I naturally suspected my grandfather Bill, as he was the only one who could have slept upstairs in that room. And we thought it may have been him playing a prank. I called out to him, but there was no answer. No laugh that would give him away. We then heard our belongings that were packed in the hallway being thrown around. The next day, I asked my grandfather Bill if he was playing a joke on us, and he insisted that he wasn't. And to this day, I still believe him. I had my 40th birthday party at Reds Park Hotel in August 2009 for old times sake. And it was the female staff that told me about the ghost. And I told them about what happened to me there 30 years before. The staff told me of their own personal experiences, the lights going off and on, the odd sightings in room five, a bride in white was seen. Again, the claims of the baby crying that made no sense at the time. I did a thorough research of the property and the Cardiff Road area. And I found out some very interesting things. Indeed, I found out from the barcode library and local newspaper archives that Gladstone Villa dates back to the 1900s. And it was named after the former British Prime Minister, William Gladstone. I discovered the previous people that lived there, the Kimmet family in 1924. 
a newly married couple, Michael and Evelyn Kimmett, and a son named Elvin. He died at four months, according to the archives. This may explain the baby my mother and grandfather kept hearing in the bedroom. Miss Evelyn Kimmett died 1970, soon after I was born. Maybe this was why the activity all started. I also found that there was a monastery in Baldwin Street where my parents met and worked. And there was a property directly opposite the former Gladstone Villa property in Cardiff dating back to the 16th century. It is now a public house called the Rafa Club. A priest hide is said to be there, but it's sealed up. This explains the monk my mother saw. What I have said here is true. I wouldn't share it with you if I couldn't possibly back this up. And I have used real names as not to hide anything. And all I have said can be verified by the family of those people mentioned. Sadly, some of those are no longer with us. I challenge any hardened skeptic and firm non believer. And I can assure them that they will indeed most certainly question their belief system. Of this I have no doubt whatsoever. You may Google the property. It's still there on Cardiff Road, Argode, Wales, UK, very near Caerphilly in Cardiff. This place needs to be thoroughly investigated and is well worth documenting. I work as a manager in an adult novelty store with a theatre. So please envision the kind of customers I get. I had this regular who was nice enough and we always exchanged pleasantries and small talk. One day we said goodbye. And as he went to leave, he stopped dead in his tracks and came back to the counter. He told me that he ignores it every time, but today it wouldn't let him. Naturally, I ask him what he's talking about. And he proceeds to tell me that there is an older black man who was with me 24 seven. He sees him every time I'm in the storm. The older man just stands next to me watching me and smiling. At that point, a chill ran up my spine. Because no one in that store knows besides my boss that I'm half black. And that my 65 year old black father that I was so close to passed in 2014. I said the usual Wow. Oh my god. So I wouldn't give anything away to see what else he said to see if it's legit. The customer proceeds to tell me that the man my father is sad about his kids not doing what he asked them to do. And one child in particular has greatly disappointed him. The man my father also wants the customer to tell me how much he loves his wife, even though she's married again. At this point, I have tears in my eyes now. Because how would this man know there's conflict between me and my siblings because of my father's death? How would this man know my mother is married again? He kept mentioning that he could feel a strong religious pull with my father. My father was a preacher. He told me a bunch of other things and asked if I was pregnant. I told him no. But apparently my next child will have my father's soul according to him. My two year old son looks like my father and loves his favorite songs. I never saw the man again after that. In 2012, I suffered a massive stroke that ended my life. As I slipped away, I'd felt an overwhelming peace come over me like I'd never had before. Things went black. Then I was ascending above and saw the city below. Next to me, I heard a voice from this orb of varied colored lights that also had a mist coming off it. It was a woman's voice. And she was telling me how excited she was to finally be with her family and see her mum and dad again. I started to feel unsure and told her I wasn't supposed to be here. Suddenly I was standing in an otherworldly place that was gorgeous. All the structures and buildings were made of what looked similar to marble, but had an iridescent color between the marbling. The buildings were decorated with colorful stones with gold embezzlement lining the buildings and glass fencing. 
I walked along the path with my arms crossed and holding them to my body. I felt lost and everyone around me was chattering happily with each other in these otherworldly clothes of satin like linens. Some people held hands and were close and joyful with each other. This place was absolutely beautiful. I came upon an old man who was sitting near a tree and what seemed to be teaching a class with people surrounding him. Some were sitting and others were standing. He called me over to join him. He was teaching the lesson of what life is supposed to be on earth, what it was originally supposed to be, and how humans were supposed to be caring for the world and the inhabitants on it. But materialism had gotten in the way among other things. I felt an overwhelming knowledge come over me as he continued to teach his class about the world, the universe, life and death. Everyone began to surround me and the old man. He put his hands on my shoulder and he said, it's not your time yet. You will know when it is. The people from the class all came in and held me in a circle. And suddenly I was back. I opened my eyes and breathed in. I was alive and back in my earthly body. This is how I came to believe in God and also reincarnation. I don't claim a religion because my beliefs are now a mix of things. Unfortunately, slowly, that knowledge that was instilled into me slowly sipped away over the years. But I felt it in the back of my mind. To me, religion became several fingers pointing to the same being. I don't need a religion to dictate my relationship with God. If you're wondering, I'm 27 now and suffer residual effects that have disabled me, but I keep going. My body may not work properly but my brain still does, and I focus on expanding my knowledge in various areas. First off, I need to let you know that I don't believe in ghosts. I consider myself a rationalist and always try to look for a rational and logical explanation to things without jumping to a conclusion. That being said, I'm having a lot of trouble explaining what I've been experiencing in our new house for the last few months. Me and my wife recently moved into an old army home. They're offered to all acting soldiers in my country and are very cheap. Most of them were built in the 60s and 80s. Our house is at the very back of a much larger section, at the top of a hill and overlooks a valley with a dense native forest below. It's very cozy and offers a lot of privacy with no immediate neighbors in a good view. At first, I had a couple of weird encounters that left me scratching my head, such as when I was walking from the front door to my car when I heard a loud banging on my tin roof, as if something hard, like an acorn, had landed on it and was bouncing down. Whatever it was, it bounced off the roof and into the branches of the tree in our front yard which begins to sag under the weight of the thing. There were no branches hanging over our house that could have dropped anything, and I couldn't see any fall off the roof, nor did any land on the ground after it made the tree branches sag. I thought it was weird and mentioned it to my wife at the time, but just sort of brushed it off. Then there were the windows in my living room. Me and my wife live alone, I had our windows open to let the breeze in because it was a hot summer's night and I decided to close them since it was time for bed. As I closed them, my wife called me outside to the backyard since she had spotted the International Space Station moving across the sky. After I came back in, I sat down on the couch and I noticed the curtains were flapping in the wind. I walked over to check the windows I had just closed and they were now wide open. I know for certain I had closed it just moments ago when my wife was outside the whole time, so she couldn't have opened it. I asked if she saw me close that window and she said she was standing in the doorway and watched me do it. I kept asking her if she was messing with me, but I can't figure out how it could have happened. The last and most troubling incident was what prompted me to make this post. Last night, I went to bed just after my wife who was already asleep. I lay in bed browsing on my phone when suddenly 
I noticed I could hear what sounded like heavy breathing. I stopped and listened for a moment, assuming it was just my wife snoring or something. But she was sleeping right next to me, and this sounded like it was coming from the far corner of the bedroom. I focused on the sound for what felt like several minutes, while being paralyzed with fear. I was convinced someone was standing at the end of my bed. I woke up my wife. She was half asleep until I said I thought it sounded like someone was in the house, which made her bolt up, and then she said she could hear it too. I then turned on all the lights and went around the house, checking all our locks and cupboards, and didn't sleep well that night. Has anyone experienced anything like this before? Am I just being paranoid? I'm usually quite level-headed, but this is starting to make me question my own sanity and judgment. A few years back, I was at my grandmother's funeral. My dad, brother and I had all gotten there early because we'd made good time in traffic, so we were waiting for my extended family. We ended up wandering around the cemetery. My brother and I were trying to find the oldest grave. Weird, I know, but my whole family are big history nerds and graveyards can be pretty cool as long as you're respectful and stay on the paths. We walked past this one grave and I just immediately felt awful. I became extremely cold and nauseous, even though it was warm and sunny. My breath caught in my throat, and I could no longer breathe, and my vision started spotting, and it all went dark. I thought I was going to pass out, and then it just stopped, just as quickly as it had started, and I felt fine. My brother was still saying whatever he was saying before, I missed about a sentence, and hadn't noticed anything. I didn't tell him about it, figuring he wouldn't believe me, so I just said we should head back before the funeral began. I probably would have dismissed the incident, except the next spring my brother and I were hanging out and climbing trees in a park. It had a lot of tall grasses you see in prairies, and a good number of trees as it backed up onto the woods. I started climbing a tree, I'd gone up a few times before, and then I got hit by the same feeling. It was the sudden nausea, inability to breathe, and vision fading out. It was identical to what I felt at the cemetery. I dropped out the tree and had to sit down until it passed. After that, I convinced my brother to leave because I felt sick, even though after it passed, I felt fine. They found a body in the woods by the park a few weeks later, mostly decomposed because it had been out there all winter creeped me out beyond belief, and I've never had that feeling since. When my brother and I were much younger, we'd have to stay at my grandparents when my mum and dad went on vacation. This happened a lot, as my dad's company would allow my mum to go with him on business trips. There was only ever one guest bedroom in my grandparents' room, so my brother and I had to share a double bed. My brother always fought with me about who had to sleep near the edge of the bed, as the other side was against a wall. I always lost, and would settle in for a sleepless night. The only way I can describe it, is every night, an hour after I got to bed, someone would sit down next to me. It never made me feel threatened, but it was always creepy to be hummed songs and have my hair moved. One night I had enough of it, and had to get out of the room. As I walked out into the living room, I saw my grandfather sitting in his favourite chair. He looked up at me and asked if Ben and June had awoken me. I quickly asked who Ben was, and what he was talking about. His story quickly unfolded. During his first marriage, he had a son, who would have been 23 and engaged. Him and his fiancée came to visit one night and slept in the room. They left late that night after arguing profusely. My grandfather overheard that June was pregnant and didn't want to scare Ben. On the way home, they were hit by a drunk driver and both passed away. I went back to sleep leaving my grandfather muttering for a good hour or more out in the living room. Sometime after he went to sleep, 
and I felt the familiar presence sit on the side of the bed with me. To be clear, my brother and I fought about it because he felt the same thing. And we never wanted to sleep on that side of the bed. He always assumed I never noticed it. I had a school trip to the concentration camps in Germany and Austria. I remember arriving at the first camp on our itinerary, Dachau. When we got off the bus, they told us to get the banners, flags, and flowers, and to put them at the front as a memorial. I got the peace flag. It was a rainbow flag with a big peace sign on it. When we were in front of the gate, I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed and being stared at. It was a creepy feeling, but I didn't mind it. As we walked through the gate, the first thing I saw was the window on the barrack I had in front of me. I saw a bald, beaten up man in the prisoner's blue and white uniform. We stared at each other for at least five seconds and he looked at the flag I was holding. I blinked and the man wasn't there anymore. I didn't really mind it because I believe in the supernatural and I expected that to happen. The tour guide afterwards gave us a device to put on our ear for us to hear him better. As he was speaking, telling us about his father's experience, as he was a child of an ex-prisoner there, my ear device started having problems. I started hearing only static sounds, so I decided to remove it. But before I was able to do this, I heard a man's voice saying words I couldn't understand. And the aura of his voice was so creepy and so angry. I was so shocked and creeped out because he seemed angry at me. I removed my earpiece quickly and moved on with the others. I'm the only foreigner in our class. So the explanation I give to myself for the earpiece thingy was that it was the man and he was angry at me for being there. I would like to share a story. In Croxley near Watford, Hertfordshire in the UK, there's a moorland with a river running along it. Halfway down the moor walking west, the river juts to the right, northwest, and the bank rises up a metre or so. On a hot, bright summer day, I was walking along towards the raised bank of the river. As I got to the peak, I looked into the river and there was a man in there. He was big, six foot four if anything, long bearded and quite fat in the water up to his waist and apparently naked. He looked at me with shock on his face, as if I had startled him, or he hadn't expected to be caught having a dip. So as to not embarrass him and because I was unconcerned, I waved a hand casually and kept walking along the bank. I intended to look away and kept looking away, allowing him to salvage his modesty. But the river turns up the bank and so I had to turn no more than three paces on, and it was clear from peripherals that he had gone. I was standing on a high bank, slightly elevated over the surrounding land. I can see both ways along the river for over a hundred meters, and he's just vanished. There was nowhere he could have gone. He wasn't underwater either. It's barely way steep and slowly moving and clear. He never even left a ripple in the water. It took me several minutes to accept he hadn't been real, despite seeing him for no more than three meters away in bright sunlight. I didn't realize he was a ghost until he vanished. And that made him the oddest ghost I'd ever seen. My best friend Amy and I have been inseparable since age 11. I basically grew up at her family's beautiful 80 acre farm in Ontario, Canada. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And I have countless good memories there. I even got married there a couple of years ago. With the good memories, there are some that I cannot explain. And it has made me reconsider what I know of the world. When Amy's family bought this property 20 years ago, the heritage farmhouse that came with it was in terrible shape. It was over a 100 years old. And it's your typical red brick Canadian farm. 
When they arrived, the kitchen floor was caved in, open like a pit. It was full of bones. They assumed that it was perhaps a garbage chute below the cooking area, but there were many different kinds of bones, including animals we typically don't eat. Weird. But they went ahead and filled it in and repaired the house. Over the years, they have transformed the place dramatically. And it's been cool to watch the process. When we were 12, Amy's youngest sister, Chloe, came up to Amy and I out of the blue and suggested we tie her up and put her in the cellar. It was obviously a weird request, but we obliged thinking it would be funny. She was a bit of a brat and it would give us a spooky thrill. We followed her down to the dirt floor basement, which of course had always felt like the creepiest place in the house and proceeded to tie her hands and feet with some soft jump rope she had provided for us. She talked us through a list of things we needed to do in a quiet monotone voice. We laid her down in the cellar, which had a heavy door to keep it cool. And she instructed us to turn off the lights and shut the door. The light was off for a second before she let out a blood curdling scream. We jumped inside in a flash to see Chloe trembling, wide eyed, and she had wet herself. To this day, I have never seen someone in a state like that an honest manic state of fear. She told us that the moment the room went dark, something heavy had shuffled in the room in a low voice and greeted her with a low rumbling. Hello. The lights in the basement flickered and she recalled the hello and we all felt an enormous wave of icy fear wash over us. We scrambled to untie her and got the hell out of there. Can you remember how it felt running up the basement steps as a kid? Like someone was after you? Far more tangible than the usual childhood imagination. It was like something reached for us as we ran. We never played in the basement again. When we talked about it later, Chloe had no memory of ever asking us to tie her up, nor did she recall even going down to the basement. She was very hurt that we had done that to her. This annoyed Amy greatly as she thought Chloe was just trying to get us into trouble. But Chloe never told her parents. And based on the glossy look in her eyes when she asked to be lowered into the cellar floor, I believe her. When we were 15, everyone in the house was having weird experiences. Going upstairs to the bathroom, there was always something in the corner of your eye rounding a corner or peering at you from a doorway. It was unsettling to say the least. As we went through the goth and emo phase, Amy started to mess around with potion making, pentagram items and other oddities. I didn't necessarily credit Amy with this, but things started to get kicked up a notch after that. I was there for a sleepover once in summer. Amy and I were sleeping in her bed and she had an alarm clock that would project the time on her ceiling in that typical red segmented alarm clock font. Weird things would always happen at certain times of the night, and we would watch the red numbers and hush our girl chat at those times and listen to the house. Midnight, 111, 222, 333, and so on. One morning I woke up just as the sky was starting to lighten. I needed to use the bathroom and was sleeping on the inside of the bed against the wall, facing Amy's posters. I rolled to my back to check the time and I could not see the hour. My blurred, sleepy eyes focused harder, but something black was obstructing the time. My eyes widened in terror as I turned my head towards Amy and realized the blackness was an entire human figure floating in the air about a foot over Amy. It looked like a mirror of Amy, but with no discernible features or form. Humanoid, but wrong. It was not dark in the room. The morning light had filled her room with a dull grayness, and I could see details across the room. I stared at this figure in horror, moving my eyes up to its empty face. No mouth, no nose, just emptiness. When my eyes met the full face, bright white eyes shot open and stared at me with an unbearable intensity. I shut my eyes in a flash and lay there, frozen and terrified for what felt like hours. I have never felt that level of fear in my entire life. I never heard a noise, 
I never felt a touch, but I felt the intense eyes upon me. At 7.30, Amy woke up to use the bathroom and listened to her hum a tiny bit, eased me enough to crack an eye open. Everything in the room was normal, and Amy returned to the bed with a thud and resumed sleep. I nudged her and asked if she could escort me to the bathroom. I told her about what happened later that day, and she was less than pleased to hear about it, and had a hard time sleeping in her room for a while after that. I'm absolutely certain I was awake, and there was not a single ounce of tired left in me when my eyes met, whatever that was. I saw my grandmother's ghost. I was six years old. We lived in upstate New York, just outside of New York City. Grandma Catherine lived in Chester County, and I have zero memory of her aside from this. One night, I woke at about four in the morning, walked into my parents' bedroom and sat in the leather wing chair my father sat in when he read. Across the room was my father's closet. The door opened, and Grandma Catherine walked to me about six feet in front of me, smiled, sort of bent from the waist and said, I just wanted to say goodbye. Then she turned, went back into the closet, before closing the door behind her, and I went back to bed. About two hours later, the phone rang. Ten minutes after that, my mother came into my bedroom to tell me that Grandma Catherine had passed away. I know, I said. What? My mother asked, gasped, and I told her my story. She made me retell it two or three times, then gripped me on the shoulder hard and made me swear on my eternal soul that I would never tell my father the story. Freaked the hell out as only a six-year-old can be, I agreed. I never told him the story either. He lived another 15 years and never heard it. By the way, I don't believe in ghosts, but I know that I saw my grandmother's one. How Aristotelian is that? I have several scary stories, but this one is particularly fresh as it just happened the other day. I went for a bit of a walk because we're allowed to exercise, came back, went to put my key in the door, and I've always had this thing where I hate, hate static shocks. So I very lightly touched the doorknob with the tip of my finger, and the doorknob suddenly turned to the side like someone was about to leave the house at that instant. I opened the door expecting to have a laugh about it, and no one was on the other side. I've since tried to replicate it. The doorknob is a bit looser on the other side, but the side that faces outwards is sturdy, and was a feathered light touch on my part. In order to wrench the doorknob like that, you'd need to grip it and twist. Still can't explain it, but given that I see shadows move around the house and random things fall over, People have independently commented on the weird vibe of the two downstairs rooms without prompting, and a video once unpaused for me the second I walked through my door, and beginning to wonder if there's something inhabiting it other than myself. Two months after my mum passed, my dad sort of disappeared, and I was home alone a lot of the time. So my little cousin would stay over with me, a lot of the time, because he was having family issues too. One night we were gaming really hard, and got hungry, and so we went into the kitchen to get some food. As I walked out of my room, we just see literally every single cabinet door, drawer, the dishwasher, and a fridge all opened, and naturally I was extremely terrified. So my cousin and I ran back into my room. This isn't a big place, it's just an apartment, because we didn't know what to do. It did not look like anyone got into our place. My cousin was extremely afraid of ghosts, and I was petrified because I thought I was haunted. And I didn't know what to do, so I ran out and turned off all the lights, as electricity bills were expensive for my 15-year-old self at the time, and pretended like nothing ever happened. And the creepiest thing happened after that. 
My cousin and I saw two feet in the darkness of the hallway away from the room in the kitchen. We never slept with the lights off in that apartment again. I now live with slight paranoia that something is always around me, and it bothers me a lot because I sometimes feel like I'm just crazy, and other times will get this sense of dread and tell myself to let it pass. And I would like to tell some of my friends and family the story, but they always say that I'm just imagining it. But why would I ever make it up? My parents got divorced when I was about 12. Some minor things happened in the first few places we lived in. We moved into this apartment complex when I was about 14. The manager ever so kindly let us know that the previous tenant passed away. Well, isn't that just lovely? So in that apartment, a lot of weird stuff happened. Once a big glass Pyrex measuring cup fell off the counter and shattered on the floor. I had made sure I put it down no less than five inches away from the edge. My cat had been sleeping on the couch the entire time. My cat used to mess up the lower cabinet doors, making them open a bit then close with a bang. One night I woke up because the cabinet doors were banging around. I got up, dragged my exhausted ass to the kitchen and yelled at her to stop. But I didn't see her anywhere in the kitchen. And then I remembered she wasn't even in my apartment. We had taken her up to my grandmother's earlier that week. When I was 16, I was sitting in the living room with my then boyfriend, being silly and taking pictures with a digital camera. Every picture we had taken that afternoon were all weird. There were orbs, drastic lighting changes and weird streaks of light and faces reflected in the computer monitor that was off and the faces didn't belong to either of us. To debunk the pictures, I cleaned up the camera lens, cleaned the monitor and made sure the lamp wasn't being too glitchy. I took a few more pictures. The orbs and faces didn't reappear but the weird lighting and streaks did. I set the camera down because it freaked me out. And the next day when I wanted to show my best friend the pictures, they were all gone. All but one of me and my boyfriend sitting next to each other. Never could explain it. That was about 10 years ago. And I'm still dealing with a lot of weird stuff that's happening in the house I currently live in. When I was in college, a good friend of mine, John, lived in an apartment above a funeral home. A small group of us frequently gathered at his place because a lot of us lived with our parents as it was a commuter school. We knew where the spare key was and frequently let ourselves in. One cloudy November afternoon, I got out of class early at about 4.30 and let myself in. I was pretty sure one of his roommates was home, so I shouted up, Hey Ben, it's me. There was no response, but that was typical. Nevertheless, I just knew there was someone else home. I sat down at the dining room table and started doing some homework. Suddenly I looked up and saw someone sitting in the rocking chair by the living room window. At this point, it's closer to 5 p.m and there's very little light left in the apartment. I didn't turn the lights on when I got in because at that time it was still light. So I'm squinting in the other room saying, Hey, Ben, what are you doing just sitting there? I sort of sensed the figure turned to look at me and the figure just slowly faded. I wasn't sure I'd even seen it, but I felt totally creeped out. I ran up the stairs to his roommate's bedroom, knocked, but no one was home. But then Ben and John came up the stairs into the apartment. I'm standing wide eyed in the middle of the living room and they're just like, what the hell dude? I tell them I'm pretty sure there was a ghost in there and they're like, oh, is that all? Yeah, we get that all the time. At first it was creepy, but now it's just whatever. And they went around their business. I totally thought they were messing with me for years. But a couple of years ago, I ran into John and brought up the story. He said he didn't remember the episode with me that day, but that yeah, they used to see weird stuff in that apartment all the time.
My earliest memory is an overheard view of the house I grew up in, roughly 30 to 40 feet above the intersection, and it showed me a crawl of words that told me the address, my name, my family's names, and ended with a message like good luck or something I quite can't remember. Then I remember being carried upstairs and a few moments later, we had a blackout on the street. Another one was when I was a bit older. I used to walk and run around the woods behind our house. Every so often I'd hear my name get called out. So I'd return to ask anyone who was there or if they called my name. Usually I got a confused look or thought you're in your bedroom. Eventually I figured it was my imagination and ignored it. It disappeared for a few weeks, but came back during an attempt to go further than I ever have. I was about two miles in. The voice called faintly behind me. I looked back and saw nothing and carried on. A few more feet and the voice got louder, kind of angry sounding. I ignored it and then it screamed at me and I felt something similar to getting punched in the chest and promptly turned around. There are some spooky things, but those are the most interesting. I lived in an old house as a kid until I was eight. It's like 110 years old now. My parents told me the ghosts started appearing after I was born. My crib was in their bedroom and my mom would wake up to hear me giggling and cooing like I was playing with someone. Other times I'd be sound asleep, but my crib would be rocking back and forth. And on three separate occasions, she says she saw a woman in a nice white dress standing over my crib. My dad frequently saw her going up and down our spiral staircase that leads to the upstairs rooms or just standing at the top of them near the balcony looking down at him while he watched TV. When I asked my sister about it, she was reluctant to talk about it, but said she'd seen her. We also heard footsteps in the attic that would stop the second a light was turned on. My dad investigated a few times, but never found anything except sometimes the attic light was on when he was absolutely positive it was off when he went to sleep. As you could see the light from under the doorway. I only remember seeing her once, but that's a story for another time. I just sort of chalked it up as something weird my whole family experienced and never really thought about it much after we moved. None of us ever got a bad vibe from her and she wasn't scary, so we just lived with it for eight years. Fast forward to me being a freshman in high school. I'm in earth science class, talking to a girl I thought was cute. It got to the, so where do you live around part of the conversation? And she said, in the old town near the railroad tracks. Oh, really? That's neat. I used to live there on Elm Street. Really? That's where I live. The white one with the green shutters. No way. I'm kind of amazed at this point. With the plum tree out front and the white picket fence with the shed in the backyard. She nods. Then I ask, have you seen her? I kid you not. Her response sent a chill down my spine and immediately gave me goosebumps. The lady in the white dress? Yeah. I was floored. I kept thinking it's like a double blind study. There's no way she could have known what I meant. And she gave me an accurate description when I didn't even say the word ghost or anything. I didn't know what a double blind study was in the ninth grade, but you get the picture. Honestly, it changed me. I went from being sort of a jock kid who wore Abercrombie and American Eagle when it was cool to listening to Black Sabbath and Pink Floyd. My whole attitude on life changed. I became a lot more relaxed and was open to new ideas. Whereas before I had this, this is what's real and this is what isn't idea firmly in my head. My mother and her cousins often played together as children. Although as a rule, none of them were supposed to be out after dark. One day when she was around six or seven years old, she and three of her cousins were playing hide and seek. They were enjoying themselves so much, they didn't notice the sun was starting to set while the full moon was rising. 
Mama, was it during this game. And after she finished counting, she went looking for her cousins. She found most of them, except Linda. After some time, Mama found Linda hiding behind a tree near a shaded area in the forest that was a little deeper than she was used to going. Even if it was near her house, it was quite unusual since she and the other children had been told by the adults to never go deep into the woods because they could get lost or taken by the spirits of the forest. Even though Mama was still a child, she could see why the adults had warned her and the other children away from the deeper parts with bamboo, mango, and other trees. It would be dark in some places even in broad daylight. But now that it was night, it was beyond pitch black. And Mama was starting to get the creeps. Psst! Startled, Mama looked to her left. And thanks to a sliver of moonlight that managed to peek through some of the branches overhead, saw Linda partially hidden behind a tree. She had a mischievous grin on her face and was beckoning to Mama to come closer. Linda, my mother was flabbergasted. What are you doing there? We're not supposed to go beyond the tree line and you're not supposed to be giving away your hiding spot. Linda didn't answer, only continued to silently beckon to Mama, but she didn't move. A chill ran down her spine and began to spread through her body as she continued to stare at her cousin. Something wasn't right. She knew it. Her cousin's normally chubby face looked angular, elongated, and her mischievous smile became sinister as she emerged from her place behind the tree, which she soon realized was a ballet tree, notorious for being the residence of evil spirits. She also noticed that Linda seemed to be growing taller with each step, and even though she wanted to run, she couldn't even move and barely scream. The figure that had taken her cousin's face lurched forward, bending over so that it almost resembled a hunchbacked witch, its eyes gleaming. Suddenly, the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs broke the silence, and Mama felt someone grab her shoulder before she was yanked backwards away from the evil that intended to steal her away. When she looked up at her saviour, she found herself looking into the eyes of her uncle Simon, who was Linda's father. He had one hand on his shoulder as he moved to stand between her and the sharpshooter that wore his daughter's face with a machete in his other hand. Mama peered around him and found the being backing away slowly until it fully disappeared into the shadows from whence it came. Without a word, her uncle picked her up with one arm and carried her back the way she had come. While she hid her face in his shoulder, not wanting to look at the darkness that could have been her grave. After some time, she found herself being carried into the threshold of her home, her parents looking furious, her various aunts and uncles worried, looking at her. All her cousins from earlier, Linda included, were sitting on the bamboo seats, trembling, with tears running down their faces. After her uncle Simon set her down, he asked her what happened and why she had gone that deep into the forest. She explained what happened, noticing the terrified looks on the cousin's faces as they listened. While the adults became even more tense than they had already been, when she was done recounting her experience, her uncle Simon told her that Linda had encountered someone she thought was Mama while she was hiding only to realize it wasn't her. She had run screaming from her hiding place, telling him and the others what she'd seen. And when they found Mama's slipper, which she hadn't realized she'd lost while searching, Uncle Simon had told Linda's elder sister to take her and the other children to my grandparents. My mother and her cousins got quite a scolding for playing past sundown, but Mama always felt that it was worth it, since she wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale if Uncle Simon had gotten there a few minutes later. Ever since that night, she's always made sure to keep an eye on the sun when she has her cousins playing, so that they can go in before dark. The next story takes place in my father's ancestral home in his hometown, 
which is a place where no one wants to try and make a life beyond its boundaries. The house is now abandoned and lies in ruins. These events took place three to four years before he passed away. I was already an adult in my late twenties. I was temporarily staying there with my father while waiting for news on the various job applications I had sent out online since my last job in the city had stressed me out so much my health had gone downhill, so I had to leave to recuperate. The house was already old and in the state of disrepair, and I have to tell you I was praying for the day that I could leave. Because not only were we living a hand to mouth existence, but my father is domineering and has a controlling attitude. It was really grating on my nerves. He kept rubbing it in my face that we were surviving on his retirement pension, since I was too weak to hold the job for a year. And he even had the audacity to tell me that I should let him manage the inheritance from my late mother's estate once it was released. He wanted to use it to set up a business, mainly because he wanted me to live out my days in that dead end town that he called home when nothing happened and no one wanted to leave their comfort zone. What he didn't know was that I would never let him touch what was mine. I was basically the maid at home doing all the cooking, cleaning, laundry, the works. I was also constantly being humiliated by our father to the relatives that we have and acquaintances, since I am and still mostly a loner. The only people I could really talk to being a few cousins who were also outcasts like me. He may have been my father, but he should never have been allowed to raise kids since loving and nurturing has never been something he understood. It was always about control. You are his puppet doing his bidding. As I mentioned, the house was old and falling into disrepair. At the time of this story that I'm about to tell you, it was no secret that the house was haunted. Even when my grandparents and other cousins resided there during my high school days, but they aren't the ones I'm going to share with you. On many occasions, I would see people walking through the house. But when I would turn to look at them, there was no one there. The passing visitors weren't just limited to human beings. Many times I even saw the animals. I had one come close to me visit after their precious lives had been cruelly cut short all in the name of finger foods that should have been eaten to go with the booze. It was almost as if my four legged friends were coming to see me one last time before going to their eternal reward. And when I told my cousins whom I was close to about them, they said it was because those creatures remembered the kindness I had showed to them and knew that I loved them. There was one apparition in particular that seemed to follow me around all the time that of a little boy, about three years old. When I would be cleaning the yard, I'd see him from the corner of my eye sitting on a bench or standing a few feet away watching me. However, he would be gone once I turned my head to look at him. Whenever I was in the kitchen preparing a meal, he would be peering at me from around the kitchen door. He was mostly a blurry figure, like what you see on the old TV screens when the signal's bad and I could never see his face but knew he was there. Once around dusk, my father was out talking to his friends and I was upstairs folding the clothes that I had gotten off the clothesline since they were dry. When from the corner of my eye I saw that child and he began to inch closer to me as if curious as to what I was doing. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently, hoping that I could give him comfort in some way. The next day, I went to my cousin Leela's house. She and her siblings along with their mother, Susan, a fellow outcast like me, but for different reasons. Technically, they're paying for a sin that was committed by their matriarch. Susan is my eldest cousin on my father's side. So Leela and her siblings are my nieces. Leela though is my age and Anna is five years my junior. But I look at them all as cousins, no big deal. I told Leela, her younger sister Anna, and their mother Susan about the little boy I kept on seeing, and they all became very quiet before exchanging a long look. Leela told me that it's known behind closed doors that Susan's half sister Victoria had several extramarital affairs and many abortions afterwards. The latter were all performed at the ancestral house, 
They said that the little boy might be one of the children who paid for their mother's sins with their lives. And he clearly took a liking to me. Because even though I'm not a mother, I'd never hurt a child. That little boy was my constant companion when I wasn't visiting Leela up until June 2014 when I started a new job in a city almost 12 hours away from where my father lived. Leela and Anna were also able to start a new chapter of their lives in a city 13 hours away from that pit we were stuck to. Two months after I left. We still keep in touch and remain close as ever because in my eyes, they along with the maternal uncle I have a soft spot and my sister and her three children are the only family I have left now. My father passed February 2016. And when I went to attend the funeral service and tie up the loose ends he had left, I saw the house had continued to deteriorate after I was gone. And I was glad I had always felt like the life and whatever courage I had to try to hold on to after my mother died when I was 12 was being drained from me the entire time I'd stayed there. The house is now in ruins completely abandoned. And the trees and plants that thrived when I was there have since withered. I met my first boyfriend when we were both 17. And in our last year of high school, his dad had passed away when he was 15 from lung cancer. And he was having a hard time with it. His living circumstances at the time were also pretty dismal. But that's another story. My ex smoked cigarettes, which his dad was really against before he passed. But he did it anyway. His pack of smokes would disappear almost daily and appear in the most random places under the fitted bed sheets in between the mattress and box spring buried in a basket of clean laundry. One night we were laying in bed and his headboard had a ledge to it that he kept his smokes and drinks on. I was laying down looking straight up at it as he sat to grab them and they flew off the headboard. I saw them twist a bit and then just get tossed. We were both stunned for a minute before we both agreed we had seen the same thing. But it still took us a half an hour to find the pack because it didn't fly across the room, but instead ended up underneath the bed quite a ways in. We weren't close to the wall, so they didn't ricochet. One night I was on my side of the bed, looking at the wall, and a clear shadow of a man appeared in front of me. Thinking it was my ex, I started talking and joking around, but he didn't answer. So I looked over my shoulder. No one there. I looked back at the wall and the shadow was still there. It lingered and walked away before my ex came back into the room. That happened occasionally. I always thought it was just him checking in and seeing what I was like. And if he was happy. Finally, we had a pretty rough breakup. He had a lot of demons. He cheated and became abusive. It was bad. He left pretty quickly as we lived with my family and he was unstable. But he left behind most of his things, including his father's ashes, his vinyl collection, magazines and guitars, etc. It was all he had left of his dad, and I refused to throw them out. So I kept them in my bedroom closet, even though it took him nearly a year to finally come round and get them. The night that everything got picked up, I heard my closet door rattle and things move around the perimeter of the room. My lamp on the nightstand flickered on and off. It was his dad's lamp. He let me keep it because I used it for my crafts. And my cup of water rocked back and forth. I said, Good night, Mr. Johnson. And take care of Danny for me. A few moments later, my bedroom door rattled. And that was that. He was a pretty chill ghost. He did smoke a lot of hash in life. So that might have helped. When I was 16, I lived with my dad, but stayed with my mum and sister every other weekend and every other week when my school was in session. I am a female. My mum was renting half of a duplex in Wisconsin at the bottom of a hill with a very old post office at the summit. 
I heard ghost stories about this post office slash castle throughout my childhood. We lived on the left side of the duplex, there was a door on the front of the house, and one on the back which we usually used. There wasn't really a backyard, as we lived at the bottom of the hill mentioned above. When you walk in the back door, you are in the living room. Next to that is the dining room, a small entryway for the front door then the kitchen. If you go through the kitchen, there were stairs that go to the two bedrooms and the bathroom upstairs. Right next to the entry to the kitchen on the main floor was the door to the basement. To the left of that was a half bath slash laundry room and a bedroom. This information is necessary, so keep it in mind. I was staying over one weekend and my youngest sister, Elena, would not sleep on her own. She was also diagnosed with ADHD, which made it tough for her to stay asleep. My other sister, Chloe, was at a sleepover one night, so I stayed in her bed so Elena could sleep in the room instead of me sharing my bed. My mum made it my job to keep her in bed and quiet or I'd get in trouble. We went to bed and everything was normal, as normal as things would ever get in that house. I woke up sometime after falling asleep, and I look at the doorway. Elena was just standing there staring at me. I instantly got mad because I didn't want to get in trouble, so I whisper yelled at her to get back into bed. I asked her what she was doing and she told me she needs to go to sleep. I looked to my right and pointed to her to get in bed. But when my eyes met her bed, I realized she was fast asleep. I looked back at the doorway, and whatever was there was gone. I still remember what I saw vividly. It was a little girl with dark curly hair, and she had been wearing an old style dress, think 40 to 50s era clothing. I remember being really confused, but not scared and just went back to bed. This was not the first time or only thing that happened. It always felt like someone was watching me. When both my sisters were there, I slept in the downstairs bedroom alone, even in summer, when it would be really hot in the room. I had to have the windows closed and locked with the blinds and curtains closed. I had seen glowing red eyes out of it on a couple of occasions. I always felt like something was trying to get me, there were many times I'd cry myself to sleep because I was terrified. I always kept a Bible under my pillow as well. My mom blew me off any time I tried to talk to her about it, so I simply stopped trying. The scariest thing that ever happened to me was when I was all alone. My mom had taken my sisters to get groceries. After they were gone, I snuck out the back door to have a cigarette. I came back in the house when I finished and sat down on the couch to watch TV. I had the cordless phone sitting on the arm of the couch, as this was before cell phones were everywhere, and I was watching my show when suddenly I heard a thud upstairs. At first I ignored it since strange things always happened. Then I heard walking above me. I started going through what it could be, and I realized I had left the front door unlocked while I stayed back out to smoke. Since there weren't any vehicles at the house, I thought maybe someone came into the house while I was out. I grabbed the phone and headed towards the kitchen. I took a weapon out of the drawer and took it and the phone with me to investigate the noise. It is worth noting that the other side of the duplex didn't have an upstairs, so it couldn't have been the neighbors I was hearing. I started going upstairs and at the top, I turn to my right and go into my sister's room. I went out and checked the bathroom and opened the shower curtain to check as well. There was nothing there either. When I went to my mum and stepdad's room, they had a bed frame with drawers at the bottom so no one could be hiding under the bed. I checked both of their closets and didn't find a thing. And that was when I realized the only place I hadn't checked was the closet hall across from the bathroom. I walked out the bedroom window to the top of the stairs and told whoever was there that if they left now I wouldn't call the police, but that my mum would be home soon. 
Then I ran down the stairs, through the kitchen and locked myself in my bedroom on the first floor. I sat on the floor again, the wall opposite where the door was. As soon as I shut the door, I heard someone run down the stairs behind me. As I sat against the wall, I cried, and all I could see was the doorknob turning violently. I was terrified. I honestly thought someone was trying to hurt me. Then I heard the car doors close outside and everything immediately stopped. These were no footsteps or anything. I heard my mum and sisters walk into the house. So I got off the floor and left my room. I was still crying and my mum found me and asked what was going on. She was horrified as I stood there with a large weapon and the phone. And I told her what happened. And she just scolded me for having an overactive imagination and that I should be better and not tell my sisters. I never told them, but always thought about this experience. A few years later, my mom, stepdad and sisters were living in their newly built house. One day, my sisters and I were in the car with my mom and talking about the old house. When Elena spoke about the man she always used to see. I told the story of the little girl and my terrifying experience of being chased down the stairs. When I finished with the second story, Claire leaned forward and said, that happened to you too? I'd never told anyone about my experiences. 10 years after my family lived there, my best friend's sister's family moved in. I went with them at once to visit. And from the moment we pulled in to the driveway, my hair stood on end. The entire time I felt like something was unhappy. I was there. Her sister said they just had some strange things happen, but nothing too bad. The youngest just kept talking about the old man who lived there. But the oldest living person in the house was late 30s to early 40s. And I still get chills whenever I think of that place. My uncle and I were super close. And I was nine when he passed from cancer. When I was a kid, there was and still occasionally is a ghost or some kind of thing in my house that hangs around my parents bedroom and detached bathroom. The bedroom is the older part of the house. We built a second story and occasionally my room. When I was alone upstairs, it would turn off the lights in whichever room I was in and turn them back on if I left that room. But turn off whatever room I was in, it would walk directly behind me with these heavy, thunderous footsteps, breathing down my neck, whisper this fast, creepy sounding gibberish in my ear, and throw stuff off my shelves. The few times I actually saw this thing, it looked to be the silhouette of a tall, skinny guy, not muscular, but not chubby. And it would only mess with me, no one else. I used to tell my uncle about this guy and how much it would scare me. And he would reassure me that I was going to be okay. And that he would always do whatever he could to protect me. After he passed, most of the ghost's antics stopped. And it would occasionally try. But I wasn't as scared anymore. And I've seen my uncle's silhouette walk through the living room. And he would tap my shoulder when he would passed me. One time when I was crying, I felt his hand rubbing my back trying to comfort me. He still hangs around sometimes. I love him still. It's nice to know, even now, that he still cares and watches over me. This happened a while ago, 2013. I used to be able to astral project through meditation. I never really had any control of where I traveled. I would just automatically end up where I did. I would always end up in a barren forest in the dead of winter. Everything covered in almost a foot of snow. I only traveled there two times without any incidents. I would just wander around a while before coming back to my body. Then I encountered the creature that stopped me from ever going back. The third time I traveled to the forest, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I wandered around a bit walking in a random direction. I stopped for a minute and looked around. I spotted a dark shape about six or seven feet away from me. 
it was this pure black wolf staring right at me. I wasn't afraid for whatever reason. And the wolf turned and started walking away from me, but stopped after walking about a foot. It looked back at me, as if beckoning me to follow it, and follow the wolf I did. I followed the wolf for what felt like 20 minutes. It led me to a clearing in the woods I had never been to before. As soon as I stepped into the clearing, the wolf ran back into the woods. I watched it run off and then looked around the clearing. The atmosphere which had felt completely normal up until this point, shifted once I saw what was standing on the other end of the clearing. It was like a pressure pushing me down. The air itself felt heavy. What was standing on the other end of the clearing was a tall humanoid creature. Its skin appeared black, pitch black. It had cloven hooves for feet, but no fur on its body. Its body was incredibly thin, to the point of being able to see its ribs. Its arms were abnormally long. Its hands ended in long talons. It had these crooked, jutting horns. I couldn't for some reason make out any facial features except for its eyes. They were bright, glowing red. I was terrified and stood there for what felt like a minute or so. This creature and I were just staring at each other before I snapped back to my body. After I returned to my body, I felt like I was out of breath and couldn't stop trembling for a good while. I was understandably pretty shaken up. I tried for some research, but Google wasn't yielding the answers I was looking for. I spoke with a few acquaintances who supposedly had more experience and knowledge in these matters than I did, and got some advice, which looking back now on the events that happened, was not very good advice. A few weeks after my initial encounter, I decided to return to the forest. Before going back, I formed a salt circle around myself as I was advised, as a protective measure. I entered my meditative state and found myself back in the forest, more specifically, but in the clearing, where I had the first encounter with the creature. Immediately, I felt the pressure and heaviness in the air, only this time it was worse. My back was turned away from the clearing facing the trees. I could feel the presence of the creature right behind me. Remembering the advice that was given to me, I summoned as much resolve and courage as I could, and made what I know now was a huge mistake. I spoke to it, trying to keep my voice as steady and commanding as I could, despite being terrified, I said, you have no power over me. Silence stretched for what was probably only a few minutes, as I waited for something to happen, or a response of some kind. What I didn't expect to happen was that the creature reached out and touched me. Have you ever been burned badly? I once burnt part of my hand with an iron once, and that was the closest thing I can compare the sensation to. The creature grabbed my neck, its talon hand encompassing the whole of my neck. It hurt so much I couldn't even find it within myself to scream. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body still feeling a slight burn in my neck, but only a phantom of what I felt before. There were no marks left behind, just the memory of the feeling. I tried to put the experiences from my mind, just forget all about it and go about my life. After all, I had a part-time job and community college classes to worry about. Everything seemed normal until about a week later. Going about by day, I would catch small glimpses of the creature for mere split seconds. I was of course alarmed, and my distress only became worse when I came to a horrifying realization. Each time I caught a glimpse, the creature would be ever so slightly closer. I tried to once again find answers to what happened through internet searches, but found nothing that appeared helpful, nor could tell me what I was dealing with. After a few days of dealing with this, things got even worse, as they usually do. I began to hear whispers as if they were coming from inside my head. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it unnerved me greatly. As the creature grew slowly closer, 
the whispers grew louder. In desperation for help, I turned to my mother. My mother is a religious woman, and after I explained everything that had happened, and was happening, she was extremely concerned. She immediately called the pastor of her church who came to the house, with the church's youth pastor as well. They prayed over me, spoke to me about spiritual warfare, because they assumed what I was dealing with was a demonic being. After the visit from the pastor, I did stop seeing the creature, but the whispers grew in volume and took a very aggressive tone. It began to wear on me and my sanity. My partner at the time claimed to know what the creature was and how to stop its influence in my life. I'm desperate to try anything to rid myself of this being. So I went along with what he said. I won't provide details about the ritual we performed as it was dangerous and I don't want anyone attempting such a thing. But it evidently worked. It's been about seven years since all of this happened, and I haven't seen, dreamt, nor felt the creature's presence or influence in my life since. Moral of the story, please be careful when you astral project. This happened several years ago, over five, but not quite 10. I have numerous health conditions. So at the time I was a homemaker and my husband worked during the day. I was taking a daytime nap one day, always keeping my bedroom door shut and locked while sleeping when my husband was at work. I had four dogs at the time, or chihuahuas that slept with me. I was sleeping peacefully for a few hours until suddenly I heard a very loud and almost aggressive pounding on my bedroom door. Although this was unlike my husband to do, I looked at the clock thinking maybe I was sleeping so heavily, he had gotten home from work and was trying to get my attention to open the locked bedroom door. When I looked at the clock, he wasn't due to be home for a few more hours. And my husband would have been saying my name repeatedly to get my attention. I was startled by the pounding, as it was very loud and as previously mentioned, seemed almost aggressive in nature. I immediately jumped out of bed, stared at the door not knowing what to do at first, since I thought someone had broken in. Then what happened next was so extremely bizarre that even I can't keep from laughing when I tell this story to others. As bizarre as this may sound, the remote control from our living room was then seen being shoved underneath the crack of our door in between the carpet and the bottom of the door. Keep in mind, I was abruptly woken up. So I thought, can I be imagining this? But this was not to be considering not one, not two, not three, but all four of my dogs were not only barking hysterically at the pounding itself, but they were on the bed staring down at the exact part of the floor where the remote was being shoved underneath it, with their hairs on their back standing straight on end. I grabbed my phone dialing 911, thinking someone had broken in and quietly told them what was going on. The dispatcher had me stay on the line with her until police arrived at the house. She informed me that I would see people walking around my house. But not to worry, it was the police scoping out the perimeter. She then tells me that they cannot find any signals of forced entry or suspicious activity. So go ahead and to go to the front door where the police would there assist me further. Upon leaving my room, not only was there no one in sight, but the remote control, all four of my dogs had just seen being shoved underneath the door was on the coffee table in the living room, right where I'd left it. I get to the front door where at least half a dozen police officers are surrounding my house with their SWAT style rifles, complete with canine units. They offered me to walk through the house. Once again, they said there was no signs of forced entry or suspicious activity, nothing that would lead them to think that anyone was ever there. I have no idea of what would have transpired had my bedroom door been unlocked. And I'm not sure I'd even want to know. To this day, I still have no idea who or what had against remote controls. To my knowledge, nothing like that has happened again since. 
To start off, I'll tell you the story about my grandma and seeing stuff. Before she was paralyzed from the lower part of her chest and down, she had three kids, my dad, my aunt and my uncle, and their house was pretty old. My grandpa works from 6am to 8pm, seven days a week, so he was never home. When my dad would be in his crib, my grandma out of the corner of her eye would see a figure standing over my dad. My grandma never had the feeling of being scared, she just called the figure his guardian angel. No one believes my grandma besides me. When I was 16, one of my ex-girlfriends and I were over at my house, and we were just talking. We came through the garage of my house, we turned on the hallway light and walked to the living room, which was out of sight of the garage hallway and laundry room. We decided to leave again, and so we walked back to the garage and I noticed that the hallway light is off and the laundry room light is on. I tell people this story and they don't believe me, or they say it's just some false wiring. But this did happen. The lights are two different colors, so I would know the difference. Some ghost was trying to mess with me. I hear footsteps all the time as well in my house, but I learned to ignore them. I'm a 23 year old male. I was very young when this took place. It is one of my earliest memories. It is still very clear and vivid. Even 18 years later, I was living with my mother at the time. My parents had me young. My mum was 16 and her father three years her senior. My dad was more comfortable playing child support than helping raise me. So with no reliable babysitter, my early years were spent on the heels of my mother, doing all the dumb stuff adults do. My mother is also a Wiccan and claims to be a white witch. So unexplained things tend to occur within her presence. I have some crazy memories regarding that as well, but I digress. My mother and I were living with her future ex-husband at the time, Sheldon. We lived in a fifth wheeler trailer in a local RV park in Central California. My mother and Sheldon were huge stoners, with weed being illegal back in the early 2000s. They constantly had to find hidden places to indulge themselves. We also had elderly neighbors who would regularly complain to the park owners and call the police about the smell. So smoking in our fifth wheel was obviously a risk and rarely occurred. And now that you have that information, onto the experience. It was later in the evening I remember my mother's friend slash dealer was over at the time. The three adults were in the back bedroom chatting and such. I was on the living room floor in front of our small TV, oblivious to the world around me. When my mother's friend was over, it usually meant one thing. We would be leaving to walk to some random place so they could smoke without fear of nosy neighbors or police. I didn't usually mind. I would just play with my big yellow Tonka trunk, being as loud as I could. Sometime later, they came out of the back room. My mother mentioned aloud that she wanted to go smoke. The other two agreed and before I knew it, I was out the door, upset I didn't get to finish my episode of Scooby-Doo. Construction of a new neighborhood filled with duplex homes was being built down our street. They were in the, what I like to call, skeletal stage of construction. All the rooms, floors and walls and roof were done. All the homes still had the salt and pepper pattern of dark light and darker tan wood. It made them in my eyes look like skeleton houses. Anyway, they decided this would be the perfect place to light up a few joints. We made our way into one of the first houses on the newly paved road with no door or windows yet installed, making getting into the house very easy. When you walk in, you're met with a staircase leading to the second floor. To the left and right of the staircase, there were two arch style doorways leading into the kitchen and dining rooms. At the top of the staircase were three hallways, two going left and right and one bigger one in the center. There was a large window hole in the back of the larger hallway. I could see the beautiful sky from it. It was dark 
and colourful, and this detail will be important for later. The three of them went upstairs and down the right hallway into one of the bedrooms. My mother told me she'd be right back and that I needed to stay right where I was at the bottom of the staircase to play with my Tonka. I agreed, too busy to care as I was already getting sawdust in the back of my Tonka. At this point, dusk had hit. There was still enough light to see, but not enough for me to comfortably venture off and gather more sawdust. Content with my already overflowing pile of dust, I sat down and started making all the loud beeping noises consistent with a five year old Tonka truck. I can't remember how much time had passed, but I suddenly heard a scratching noise coming from the left archway. Scared of everything that my five year old mind could conjure up to explain the noise, I stayed out pretending not to hear the increasingly louder scratching. I just increased my beeping noises to overpower the scratching. And after some time, the scratching stopped. Suddenly, a small piece of wood started tumbling down the stairs. Reluctantly, I slowly turned my head to the top of the stairs, and I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this moment. At the top of the stairs was a very dark mass. When I say dark, I mean dark enough to completely block my view of the large window hole mentioned earlier. It had large red piercing eyes. The eyes remind me of the Reaper character from the cover of the Disturbed album, 10,000 Fists, if anyone is familiar. The creature was very tall and wide, and didn't do anything but just stand there. And I remember being frozen in place, unable to make a single sound. And that's when I went unconscious. Luckily, I think this is what saved me. My mother said when recalling the experience, she didn't hear my loud truck driver noises and went to check on me. She exclaimed she witnessed me unconscious on the floor with this creature descending the staircase towards me. She yelled aloud, you have no power here, leave now, and it vanished into thin air. I woke up next morning at home in bed. Sheldon and the friends didn't witness the encounter and didn't believe our claims, but that didn't matter to us. We knew the truth. That experience bonded us, and I think it helped bond our relationship into what it is today. My mum truly is my best friend. I still don't know exactly what the creature was or why it showed up when it did. My mother and I just call it Phantom. I never saw it again, but its impact is still lasting on me. I have nightmares occasionally, reminding me that there could always be something sinister lurking in the shadows. I lived in a haunted house for almost four years, from 2013 to 2017. There were two separate entities living in that house, a ghost of the previous owner's wife who passed away of cancer, and something more sinister, which I will get into now. The first real occurrence I remember in that house is two weeks after we first moved in. Now mind you, we live in a very quiet road, the occupants of the cul-de-sac being mostly elderly. This means there are rarely a lot of cars going up or down, nor is it a through road. Also, the walls of the house are very thick, so you can't hear much when the doors are closed. I'm downstairs at 8am-ish making breakfast, usually as sugar cereal as I have no regard for my health, when all of a sudden I heard the loudest growl in my right ear. It made me jump and scream, running full tilt to my parents' bedroom. Funnily enough, before my scream woke her up, my mother later told me she had a dream of a dark oppressive force stalking into the kitchen and coming up behind me. My mother is a very religious Catholic woman, so she doesn't take these things lightly, nor does she speak about these things lightly. There are even more stories of scary things that have happened. We don't live in that house anymore. My mum blessed the house her way, as well as my dad blessing the house in the traditional Hindu expulsion of spirits. The house would be quiet for two weeks, and then like clockwork, it would start up again. I'm no expert on the paranormal, but that house had an entity which wasn't human. 
I grew up in a neighborhood deep in the woods in an area full of cults and forgotten graveyards. When I was eight, there was a series of thunderstorms that caused our electricity to go out for a few days. Every night, the lightning and thunder and the wind howling would terrify me, and I would run crying to my parents' room and beg them to let me sleep in their room. One night, I woke up to a lady's voice calling my name. I sat up, realizing I could hear the thunder again, and thinking my mum had come to get me. Instead, the warm glow of soft candlelight flicked on the walls of my room. A beautiful woman stood in my doorway. She was wearing an old fashioned white nightgown that looked to be from the early 1900s, and was holding a candle with one hand cupped protectively around the flame to keep the wind from blowing it out. She had long curly dark hair, deep brown eyes and looked to be of Native American descent. At first I thought it was my mum wearing strange clothes. But then she called my name again. And it wasn't my mother's voice. Are you afraid of the thunder? She asked. I was not afraid although she was a stranger, her presence was soothing. But at that moment the thunder roared and I was scared again. Don't be afraid. She told me smiling. There's nothing to be afraid of. Lightning flashed and I woke up suddenly from the dream and found myself sitting upright. My mum was standing in the darkness where the lady had stood. Get up. I've been calling your name for the last five minutes. You can't sleep in my room. Well, where's the lady? I asked her, wondering if I was still in a dream. It had felt so real. What lady? The lady in white. My mum only really stared at me for a moment, then turned and went back to her room. I haven't mentioned the lady who visited me to anyone since, but I have always wondered who she was. Was she an angel or a ghost? A dream or a vision? I guess I'll never know. This encounter happened when I was about eight years old, living in McAllister, Oklahoma. I know what you may think, because this is going to sound very bizarre and being such a young child. You may assume it's an overactive imagination. However, I am certain that these events happened that night. And it was more than the overworkings of a childhood mind. One night I woke up in my bedroom that me and my younger sister Autumn shared at the time. There was a faint bit of light in the room that was illuminated from the lights from the park that sat in the backyard of my house. When I awoke, I adjusted my eyes and noticed a dripping dark spot on the wall. I couldn't tell what it was, but it looked like blood. And from the spot, there were steady drips that dripped down to the floor but vanished completely, just inches from the floor. Not understanding what I was looking at, I awoke my sister whom slept on a separate twin bed at the opposite end of the bedroom. After I shook her awake, and she became focused, I asked her if she saw what I was seeing. She saw it too. It was just a solid thick dark blob dripping down the wall. Unable to figure out just what we were looking at, I decided to turn on the bedroom light. I turn around to head in the opposite side of the room where the light switch was located. And after about two feet, I run into what I can only describe as a wall. But the issue is there isn't supposed to be a wall there. Confused, I'm explaining to my sister that there's something blocking my entry to the other side of the wall. I begin trying to feel this wall that was just mysteriously there. But I can't see the area as it was too dark, which was weird. Because there's a lot of light that illuminated the room and I should have been able to at least make out some detail. While feeling this wall, I could feel that it had ledges and that I could climb it. So I did. I was able to climb it all the way until I climbed to the ceiling and hit my head. I climbed back down still needing to get to the light switch. But there was a way to try and get to the other side of the room. In this bedroom, there was a closet which stretched the entire length of the wall. It was a big elongated closet that had two open cased doors on each end of the wall. So I told my sister to wait there and that I was going to the closet. 
The door nearest to us walked down to the opposite end and came out to the other door, which was right by the light switch in the bedroom door. So that's what I did, and I was able to make it to the other side. Once on the other side, I felt for the door and found it, but I noticed something strange. When I turned and looked towards the side of the room that my sister had slept on, which was right by the window too, and illuminated the entire room, I didn't see the window which I should have been able to. Still, I needed to find that light switch and shine some light on the matter. The light switch was just left of the bedroom door, so I felt the door once more, and the knob, and I knew that I was close and it was just a tad further. The strangest thing occurred. All I could feel was the bottom of the switchplate. I was plenty tall enough to reach the light with the greatest of ease. However, no matter if I stood on my tiptoes or jumped as high as I could, the light switch was just outside of my reach. Now it's time to explain the most bizarre part of the whole encounter that I can remember. While struggling to reach the light switch, I stumbled and fell forwards. And when I did, I was seeing inside the living room, which would mean the bedroom door was wide open. And if it was, it would have been obvious because the living room was lit with a window which was illuminated by a street light that shined through the living room window. There was also a VCR with a bright digital interface that my dad never set the clock to, so it constantly flashed to 12. It was well lit in the living room, and I could make out the furniture, coffee table and the like. As I'm laying face down on the floor staring into the living room, I'm wondering how this is. The door had to be shut. So I looked over my shoulder and the bedroom door was shut, which was painted white and was clearly noticeable due to the bright color and the amount of light I had. But somehow I'm in the middle of it, like the door was a hologram. I can't run through the living room and get my parents because their bedroom is just off the living room. But I have this. Gut instinct, I guess. So my only thought is I pull myself back through my bedroom. And I pull myself back and everything goes dark. I'm face to face with the closed door again and I begin to feel the door shut. Not knowing what else to do, I make my way through the closet and find my sister still sitting on the other side of the bed and the light shining through the window, which verified me that something was blocking the entire room. I tell her I can't turn on the light and she didn't know what to do. She tells me to touch the wall, not the mysterious wall that just appeared out of nowhere, but the wall that in the beginning was bleeding. As I touch the wall, I get what feels like an electrical shock, but it doesn't hurt. It just throws me back and lands me on my back. Feeling completely out of options and scared out my mind, my final conclusion is to lay with my sister in bed, hoping to make each other feel safe and a little less scared, and we both cried ourselves to sleep. I woke up next morning and thought, wow, what a strange dream. Then realized I was still in bed with my sister and the bedroom was back to normal. After she awoke, she was able to recall the night's events. I've spoken to a famous paranormal investigator about this about 10 years ago. He told me he believes at that point, I felt through the door and had a strange feeling of not going through and seeking my parents. He believed it was my guardian angel looking over me. If I'd have completely crossed the threshold, I could have been caught in another dimension, never to return. This story starts a while ago when I was five. So just to give you an idea, you would open my door and on the right is my dresser. And then to the far right is my bunk bed and a window. And then on the left is my TV and a closet. I slept in my bunk every night. However, I would wake up every night to see a body part or something akin in my bed. My dad has a very strong haunting on his side of the family. My parents and I kind of wrote it off as just little kids nightmares, since my mum doesn't really believe in spirits. Fast forward till I was seven, and I was still having these nightmares. And I started having nightmares about a girl in the corner of my room. She was beautiful absolutely gorgeous. She had long dark hair, wore a pretty white floral dress, 
and I started seeing her in real life, but only little glimpses from the corner of my eye. It was really creepy as you may guess. I was old enough to understand that wasn't a real person in my bedroom. So I started to see her get worse and worse looking every night and she would start walking over to my bed, but I could only see her head since I was on the top bunk. She would lay beneath me in the bottom bunk, which was a little play area at the time until I fell asleep. I got brave one night and decided to ask her what her name was and why she was here. All she said was that she was called Elizabeth. She stopped coming for a while and then stopped coming at all. Fast forward to when I was nine, I started to have really bad sleep paralysis nightly. It eventually went away and now I get it every few weeks. When I was 11, we moved to Virginia. I lived in Texas previously. And as soon as I got there, I decided to explore around. So I did. I saw a river and pond and some other stuff. Then I saw a small forest that was a small area of loads of trees. I walked into the trees and found some graves which creeped me out since they were obviously abandoned. I was reading along all of the names and I found one, Elizabeth. That's when I turned and bolted back home. After that, I would wake up and hear her in my room again. She looked so awful this time. She appeared to be burnt, her hair frizzled, and basically looked like she'd just come out of a fire. I started waking up a few minutes earlier than when Elizabeth came, and another girl with blonde hair and flowy, light yellow dress would sit on my bed and tell Elizabeth to leave. Once she came, Elizabeth would scream and go. I was only 11 and this scared me badly. I would cry and the girl would always tell me her name was Lillian. I know this sounds fake, but it's absolutely true. Elizabeth eventually left and I started having more dreams about a little girl, pulling me out of the bed and making me laugh, taking me outside. I would always pull away and run back to my bed. After that, I got super into spiritual things and saged my room. These dreams ended and I found a few weeks later, the people who were buried there died in a fire. I still see her in public or crowded spaces from time to time, but for now she's gone. I'm not sure what happened to Lillian as I haven't seen her since. Holiday house? Well, not for me and my mum. Before I start, I will take you back to 2014. This happened in Queensland, Australia. I think you can only go there if you're working with this family service. I have absolutely no clue. You stay there for a few days, there's a beach nearby and some historic places to visit. Pretty fun and quiet town. The house has also been there since the 90s. To give you an overview of some of the events, my older sister, saw a shadow man in the master bedroom bathroom, a tall man in his 40s with a white dress shirt and his sleeves rolled up. The man was pure evil and my sister found him absolutely terrifying. She fled straight away. Upstairs in the second room, me and my brother were being troublemakers and jumping on the two beds. When we decided to pull the mattress off the first bed, what we saw was unforgettable and we couldn't explain. There on the second mattress was stained blood covering the side of the bed with a kitchen knife. We screamed and got our mum, but the whole scene was gone when we got back. No blood, no knife. On another occasion, we were playing hide and seek. There was this small room in the staircase. It was meant for kids to chill out with a chalkboard and cushions and a lamp. But when I went in and turned the corner, there was a six year old boy scared. He was wearing overalls, shorts, long socks, a shirt and shoes. I panicked and crawled out. Something else that happened was me and my brother shared the room upstairs. We were talking to each other in the dark when the closet creaked open. 
We were terrified and it looked like a large shadow was inside, with his hand on the door, long fingered. We both jumped off the bed and ran out. This time in 2017, the man was still there. There was also another incident of constant footsteps. There were cribs now, and we were checking out the place, and one of the baby mattresses from downstairs on the top of the staircase. Me and my mum heard dragging noises, but were already scared. We weren't welcome, and got the feeling, whatever it was, there's something terrifying in that house, and I'd rather not go back. I once had a very odd interaction with a phantom. I was 11 and sleeping on a cot in my mum's room, near the foot of her bed. Really late into the night, I felt like someone was trying really hard to wake me up. I opened my eyes to see this old woman sitting on the floor with her arms crossed and rested on my cot and her chin rested on her arms. This meant her face was only half a foot from mine. I remember she had dark colored hair that was almost a bluish black, and it was cut short and styled into those feathered curls I've seen a lot of old women wear. My jaw dropped and I immediately scooted as far away from her as possible. And just as I started sucking in the air to scream, she interrupts me and says, now don't scream. I have been to every person in the house and you're the only one who can see me. She scolded me in such a normal way that I sort of calmed down. This whole time, I didn't think I was completely awake. I think I was just half asleep, and that's why I was just accepting everything that was happening to me like it was normal. I think I asked her what she wanted or why she woke me up, and she said she needed her damn papers. She kept implying that this was her house and she can't find her paperwork to give to her kids. I tried telling her I can't find her stuff. All of our stuff was here now, but she scolded me again and made me get up and look. So I went out into the dining room, turned on all the lights and started going through my mum's important paper drawers to find her stuff. I can remember her getting confused and saying she didn't recognize any of our furniture. And I yelled at her, of course you don't because this isn't your stuff, it's ours and tried to tell her it's our house now and that her papers wouldn't be here. I still remember her face as she looked down really sad and confused. When I yelled, I must have woken up my mum because she came out and asked what I was doing and the lady vanished. I angrily told my mum some woman got me out of bed because she wants her papers. I never saw her again and no one else in my family said they saw or heard anything other than me walking around and looking for stuff. I have a gift that's a blessing and a curse. Things will just come to me suddenly, and I will tell them to people and sometimes they get angry. But later, they will come back to me even years later and say, Hey, guess what? You were right. I also get premonitions when the phone is about to ring. And I think of the person and what they're going to talk about. And then the phone will ring about 30 seconds after. And often when I'm thinking of someone before I interact with them unexpectedly, it's like their energy is meeting my energy before I even knew they're going to speak to me. The man that I was with on and off for for 20 years, he and I definitely had a connection. It was a little creepy sometimes. For a long time, we were only corresponding by letter and our thoughts would cross each other as if we were thinking at the same time, even though we had no real way to communicate. I also can feel when someone is thinking about me especially if it's a guy that likes me that I just met and I'm not around them. Lots of other mystical stuff in my life, but I consider them spiritual gifts because I'm Christian and don't think of myself as any type of medium or psychic or anything like that. I had a really strange experience on my Facebook page for empaths. One day, someone posted a photo and asked if someone could read it. Then it turned into a bunch of people posting different photos of themselves or other family members or pets. You didn't even know who they really were. They were just people on that page that felt they had the powers of a medium and they would try to express what they thought from the photos. But a lot of them were very vague and random and sometimes completely off point. 
I, on the other hand, seemed to have a deeper understanding of the people just from looking at them. It was as if I was able to read their spirit, their desires, their feelings, and their situation from just the picture. People began to reach out for me for more information from all over, and I had to put a stop to it, because it's not really a path I wanted to take. I've had other experiences like that, and I don't believe that they are anything to do with me. I believe there is just a lot of energy transferred between people, and we are all the same kind of energy. We just aren't aware of it. People who have crossed over and passed away and come back often describe seeing like a web among all other humans going around their lives, as if everyone was actually connected by this energetic force. That is why they say that whatever you put out into the universe will definitely affect those around you, even if you are unaware of it. If you're being hostile and negative, that energy is going to get picked up and vice versa. This is why it's so important that we try to have an intentional effect upon our environment, and not be so controlled by emotion or mental state or physical state. I've also heard that studies have been done showing that prayer actually does help people, and if you think hateful thoughts about someone or want them dead. This can also actually physically affect a person, probably more so if you are connected to them in some deep way. I lived in Kensington, a part of Philadelphia that has the largest open heroin market, and so it looks like the walking dead with drug addicts slugging around everywhere. It wasn't uncommon seeing some of them go into the back alleyway to shoot up. We could see this from our bedroom window. I was four or five the first time I saw something out of the ordinary. I remember it clear as day. My siblings and I were playing in the middle bedroom, having a good time being kids. My mom has just introduced us to her new boyfriend at the time, and they came upstairs and watched us from the hall. I don't know what happened, but during our fun I got the feeling of being watched, and I just had to turn in that direction, which happened to be the one window in the middle bedroom. I looked out and first saw what appeared to be a man, but then when I examined it closer, I noticed he didn't have a face, and his skin from his head to toe had a texture of a wrinkled plastic bag. I remember it reflecting the orange glow of the streetlight and being scared. I was staring a good 20 to 30 seconds and quickly turned to my mum who was standing at the door, and said there's someone waiting for us. But when she rushed to the window it was gone. Fast forward many events later, I'm on the couch watching Disney Channel. It was an ordinary day. I waited all day to watch this movie, so I sat downstairs alone so that I could do that, which was rare for me, as I was always afraid at this point in life, I would see shadow people regularly, another paranormal phenomenon would happen, but I felt pretty good besides my siblings, and they didn't seem interested in the movie. Now like I said, everything was going well when about halfway through this movie, I see out of the corner of my eye someone step up to the doorway of our kitchen, I turn up and see a figure standing there, it looks like a man. The only different is he's as white as snow, his skin and clothes as white as a blank sheet of paper, but his eyes were dark like the void. I didn't scream or run away after witnessing this personal thing just appear in our kitchen doorway. I just stared at it, with it staring back at me. So I slowly got up and made my way upstairs to where my siblings were trying to explain to my older brother that I saw something downstairs. The creepy thing is he or it didn't move from his spot, even as it slowly left my view. And I went up the stairs. I also did not feel any negative energy or malevolent energy from it. It was just startling seeing an all white man standing there. I was used to shadow people and other stuff. So my question is, has anyone else ever encountered a pale white person with black eyes? <laughs>